Thank you, Aki, and good afternoon, everybody. I, I trust your heads were equally tender this morning. And I thought to kick off, who is here for, the, for Tom uh, Raftree's keynote on Monday morning? So Tom kicked off, effectively, he was at the top of the agenda. He had a hat on his head. I'm finishing. I'm at the bottom of the agenda. So I give you socks. So I, I'm guessing that not many of you got to go outside, get away from the, the lights, the laser lights last night, and go and gaze up at this amazing African sky that we enjoy, <coughs> at, uh, and to see the, the Milky Way in a way that's quite unparalleled, actually, in other parts of the world. And, you know, that, that sky has, looking up at that sky over the eons of, of our existence as a species has often prompted people to ponder and imagine what's out there and imagine what could be happening next. So I wanted to use this a little bit as a theme for my uh, talk this afternoon. And I want to stick to the notion of maps. You'll hear I called it Hack the Map. The very, very first map ever found was not about the earth, it was about the night sky. It's 18,000 years old and it's a system of dots that were found in a cave in southern France that map out the stars that were visible to early man 18,000 years ago. And if you think about maps and, and our history as a species, our progress on this planet has often been mapped and captured in that artifact of a map as we've, as we've moved forward. So I want to kick off just by asking you to reflect a little bit on the progress we've made to date and why the maps we've had to date may not be sufficient to take us uh, forward. Now this example here is a map from 500 BC. And if you think about the technology available to people in that day and age, they didn't have much more than a couple of pack mules and maybe some horses. And what they knew of the world was uh, circumscribed by how far they could travel. So they had simple ships as well. But they thought the earth was flat. They genuinely believed that you could sail off the edge and disappear. And this view of the earth encompasses what little they knew of Europe, Asia, and uh, North Africa at that time. Clearly, the map does not reflect the territory at that stage. Track forward 1,500 years, and not a heck of a lot has changed. I mean, it's hard to, to kind of visualize what this map is trying to tell us, but it was in fact a map that was describing the spread of religion in Europe. And uh, again, doesn't bear much relation to the territory. But now we track forward another 400 years or so to that golden age of ex exploration driven by the Portuguese, uh, and there's always one sort of driving force behind it. In our day and age, it was Steve Jobs to a large extent and people like Elon Musk. Back then, it was King Henry, the navigator of uh, Portugal, who sponsored and, and was the patron of these early explorers who set out to try and understand how the world hung together. And if you think about it, it's quite astonishing that with very little in, the ter in terms of technology, they had a compass, they had a thing called an astrolabe, they had these charts called ephemeries, they had an hourglass, there were no clocks or watches back then, and they set off in these tiny little boats to explore the world. And they opened up the trade routes to India and the Far East. They obviously landed here in Africa. And they, they kind of expanded our horizons as a species and helped us understand what the world was all about. And maybe the greatest invention of that era in around about the 1440s was Gutenberg's printing press. Because that, like the internet today, had a profound change on how information was made available to people. It broke the stranglehold that the Catholic Church had held till then on information, and it allowed people to understand and get access to knowledge that they never had before. So it was the first step towards democratizing information. But at that stage, if you look at the map of the world, it's looking a little bit more like what we understand it to be today. But you can see in the top right-hand corner there, still vast areas of what we today know as China, completely blank. The uh, east coast of, of South America mapped a little bit, but the hinterland, an unknown space. So again, the map's getting better, but it doesn't really resemble the territory. 
But back in those days, with there only 500 million people on this planet, those tools and those maps were sufficient for mankind to progress. Now we track forward into the Renaissance, that great era of enlightenment, and you start to see more technologies coming into play. You see the, uh, not the invention by Galileo, but the improvement by Galileo of the telescope and his ability now to study the stars and the solar system, and again, to expand our horizons and understand that we actually live in a heliocentric uh, solar system rather than the old model that the Earth was the center of everything. You saw this guy, Antony uh, van Leeuwenhoek, who is known as the father of microbiology, improving the microscope and being the first person to look at single-cell organisms. And the pencil was invented allowing people to take notes and do things they hadn't been able to do easily before. And clocks, allowing more accurate navigation and for experiments and things to be timed and you know, how long it took the flight of a star through the night sky and so forth to be more accurately uh, determined. And of course, apt to our discussion today, and you've seen a few videos on it, this great polymath, this, this individual who perhaps more than any others shaped our thinking for the modern era and who had ideas that didn't come to be executed because they didn't have the material technology to do it, but was already thinking about things like battle tanks on the bottom left here and the helicopter on the top right there and you know, gigantic crossbows and the like. So very much a, a man of his times who shaped a lot of the thinking we have today, Leonardo the first Renaissance man. And in his day and age, you can see the map now getting a lot more uh, accurate around you know, what the world really looks like, but still not reflecting the territory correctly. You see this big chunk at the bottom here, what we would now know as Antarctica and Australasia, basically being called Terra Australis uh, Incognito. So they didn't really know what was going on down there. And I would suggest they still don't. But that was the Renaissance, and those, again, those technologies and those maps were sufficient for a time in the world when we only had about 650 million people on the planet. Then, of course, we come into the end of the Renaissance, sort of out, in the, out of the Enlightenment and into the Industrial Era. And Tom, again, yesterday, when he talked about this, he specifically mentioned the spinning jenny on the, uh, in the middle left-hand row of this particular slide. And, and he talked about the Luddites. What's important, and it's as important today as it was back then, is that on its own, the spinning jenny was a marvelous technological innovation, but it wasn't sufficient to drive that massive uh, industrialization that we saw back in the, the 1700s and on into the 1900s. So it took, for example, the invention of the sewing machine to be able to do something with this cloth that was able to be produced much more cheaply. It took the invention of the railway and steam engines to move these newly manufactured goods around the world and open up you know, new trade routes and new markets and new urbanization and so forth. And many of these things are still with us today. And we look at them now and we think they're pretty crude, but they were the start, really, of the, of the era that we're, we're just coming out of right now. And if you look at the map at the turn of last century, the one we left behind 17 years ago, you can see that the world is pretty much figured out. We kind of think we understand where everything is, how it all works, where the currents in the sea are, where the sea routes are, and so forth. And again, those technologies and those maps were sufficient for an era that began with about 1.6 billion people on the planet. But let's kind of take a moment and pause and think about where we are right now. That is our population to, uh, today. You can see the blue, the blue space there represents how we have grown exponentially as a species on the back of the Industrial Revolution, where we could deliver better nutrition, better health care, and a whole host of benefits to human beings. And I just thought I'd put this in some context for you. I was born in 1957. When I was born, 2.8 billion people on this planet 268 million people in Africa. Today, we sit at 7.5 billion people. So in my lifetime, the population has grown 2.7 times on the planet and 4.6 times in Africa. 
So we have, we have 19 of the highest, of the 21 high growth uh, countries in our continent. And by, by uh, 2050, we're gonna be looking at nine billion people on our planet if, if things continue as they are, and around 2.47 billion people on our continent. So those pose some interesting challenges for all of us. And again, Tom talked about some of the upside things that are coming uh, in terms of the top 10 technologies like renewable energy and so forth. We need those things because you can see on the list on the left-hand side here, there's lots of challenges that we need to face. And what I want to suggest to you is as we enter this digital economy, we now have available to us some new tooling, some new technologies, and it really is time to think about redrawing our map. So the question you hopefully have been begun formulating as you've been here over the last uh, two days is how are you gonna go out there when you get back to your organization and build a new map to a new future using these new technologies that again, uh, we've heard so much about over the course of the last couple of days. Now, pretty much everything on the, on the yellow, in the yellow text there is in some way, shape or form encompassed by what SAP and our partners and our ecosystem are doing. So for the rest of this presentation, I wanna spend a little bit of time just talking about those, those things and, and, and some of the ideas that we think are gonna be really important for you to embrace going forward. The first thing is there's a big shift coming. It's actually quite a subtle shift, but it's a very profound shift, and it's this. When I joined the IT industry many, many years ago, too many years to remember, and, and certainly parties like, like last night don't help the memory, but, but when I joined, we were very focused on building MRP systems and accounting systems and focusing on the automation of business processes. That was kind of task number one. And only later did we say, well, we've now got a whole lot of information here. Let's do some business intelligence with it and see what it all means. So business intelligence philosophically, if you like, came after the notion of automating your business processes. The big shift today is this, that things will start with the data, they will start with the analytics, they will start with machine learning, and what insights you gain by starting with the data will help you figure out, often in real time, what to do next, which process to execute next, which business model to invoke next, and so on. So it's a subtle shift, but an important one to get your head around, because the digital economy is all about data. We have an unparalleled ability to get it from anywhere today, and to do pretty much anything with it, which in itself raises some new concerns around things like ethics and privacy. But take that as kind of ground zero. It's all about the data. And as Gartner was saying last year, by 2020, now that's only three years away, by 2020, 80% of the business processes and the products that stem from that industrial era that we're exiting right now will have either been reinvented or they'll have been digitized or they will have been eliminated altogether because we will have found new ways to do uh, business processes and various other activities that we undertake. 2020 is not very far away. If you think of how long it used to take us to implement an ERP system, that's kind of an ERP implementation away and we're talking about this really enormous change that's going to come. And you're already seeing the first signs of it out there. How many of you in this room here use Uber? And if you were partying in Joburg last night like you partied here last night, you should definitely have been using Uber. Uber is, is a great example of an organization that's built on data. It understands who wants a ride, it understands where those rides are, it understands how many people want to ride at any point in time, it applies an algorithm to that so it can figure out whether it should be doing some surge pricing so that it can maximize the monetary opportunity for both itself and the people who provide the rides in the form of their cars. It's all driven by data and the ability to connect us up through applications. And uh, I think uh, Brett yesterday mentioned that they themselves now are being challenged locally by Taxify who are coming with a, an alternative offering to Uber. And I think in a couple of years time, both of them will be challenged by the blockchain because when we move to the blockchain, we do not need 
either an Uber or a Taxify. We'll simply go out there onto a blockchain, look for a smart contract, and organize a ride without necessarily needing to go through any intermediary because we'll be able to deal directly with each other in a trusted way. But again, this is another point of view. What I hope it, say, it says to you is there's a distinct sense of urgency here. This one talks about 2018, one third of the top 20 in every industry being touched by digital disruption. So I guess the choice we all have is, do, you know, do we disrupt ourselves or do we wait for someone to come along and do it to us? And they do it really fast, and they do it in ways that create enormous competitive advantage. I, I find this quite astonishing that in this day and age, it still takes a company like J&J &J or Procter & Gamble nearly a year to go from an idea to having a product on the shelf at Walmart. Then you look at an organization like Quirky, which embodies all of the essential sort of aspects of a new generation organization born in the internet, born with this kind of sharing mindset, born to collaborate. And with Quirky, you can get a product on the shelves in 29 days. And it's worth going to go and look at their website if you're interested, if you're in product development, just to see the kind of thing that they do. But that gives them the ability if, if those products are failures, it doesn't really matter because they can fail 10 times for every single failure that Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson can afford to do. So it, it changes the dynamics of industry dramatically. And underpinning a lot of this is, of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And again, Tom alluded to this in his keynote yesterday that there's a lot of of uh, naysaying, a lot of dooms, doomsday sayers who you know, talk about the fact that these tools are going to decimate jobs. I, there's a study that I think came out from Oxford University last year that talked about two, two billion of the three and a half billion jobs that are done in the world today disappearing by 2030. So two thirds of all the workers we know today gone. Now, will that eventuate? Maybe. But new jobs will definitely emerge as we move forward. And, and what we need to be thinking about, and if any of you went to um, De Dev Govinder's presentation just now on how they're using robotic process automation at uh, Nedbank, very interesting presentation, and drawing on what we see on this slide here, they're looking for ways to use robots to, as, they, as, as Dev said, take the robots out of us put them in a machine so we can do the things that only humans can do, the empathy, the creativity, the human relationships. That's how we should be looking at these new technologies. And they are fascinating. They, they, I believe they're going to help us build a much more inclusive society. People who today may be shut out from the workplace because they have some or other kind of impediment or disability may well be able to talk to artificial intelligence driven machines like being, uh, these, these ones that are being developed by Google where this AI can already lip read better than a human expert. Just think what that means for people who today may not be able to participate and yet may have a huge amount to offer. Again, uh, in, I think it was in 2016 or late 2015, another AI program that showed that it's able to match and beat pathologists in the analysis of histopathological samples of cancerous tissue. And what's really interesting is not only is this thing faster than a pathologist, but it finds patterns in the cellular structure that the pathologists are not even looking for. So this machine may help us win the race against some of the dread diseases that are out there today. And also in a, in a continent like Africa where we have so few doctors per capita across the continent, using this type of technology is really going to help us offer healthcare services to that massively growing population. So we, we should not be scared of these things, we should be embracing them and looking at how they can help us to live better on the planet. And they do change everything. Elon Musk has come up a couple of times in this conversation, but one of the things I find fascinating about this is when Elon Musk's cars are out there driving around on the road, not only is the individual car 
learning more about how to drive as it mimics the driver and understands the route that it's following. But every time one car does that, it can share that with all the other cars in the Tesla fleet worldwide. So very, very quickly you get this exponential expansion of information about how these cars need to go. And they will get much, much safer and much more, uh, more responsive very, very quickly because of that. So those are a couple of examples of how the world is changing, why I think we need to rethink our maps, uh, and why it's, you have to do it quite quickly, because this is Darwinism on steroids. We don't have a million generations to kind of evolve to deal with some of the challenges that we have. We have to do it now. We have to do it today. And it is a challenge. We know that. Uh, one of the big challenges, of course, is who in here considers their organization to be reasonably successful? Come on, it's okay to say that. Okay, and therein lies our big problem because when we're successful, we kind of think tomorrow is going to be the same as today. And one of the things we have to do, and I think Alvin Toffler put it really well when he talked about the fact that the illiterate of tomorrow won't be the people who can't read and write. It'll be the people who can't sort of unfreeze themselves from where they are today and learn new things and then keep that process going. Because everything we learnt when we went to business schools in our youth about Porter's value chain and BCG matrices and why you need to do vertical integration, etc., etc., is up for grabs today. This is not to say you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there is definitely the opportunity to challenge some of the, the thinking that we have that was based on the constraints of the industrial era. Because information is abundant and we can do new things with it. And again, you saw this slide earlier today when Raphael uh, talked about, um, did his presentation, so I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I think it's, it's kind of sobering to think that, you know, nearly two thirds of all CEOs believe the next three years is gonna be as important and as crucial as the last 50, and yet only 5% of organizations think they've mastered digital. And maybe it's good that they don't think they've mastered it. Maybe it's good we never think we've mastered anything because that keeps us hungry and it keeps us inquiring, keeps us moving forward. But you can see there's a distinct uptick in the interest in digital transformation. Now this is just one, uh, one data point, it's a, it's a Google search, but I think it kind of tells a story in its own right. So more and more of your competition, more and more of your peers are climbing on this boat and trying to do something about it. And that, of course, raises the question of, well, how do we do this stuff that we've all been hearing over the last couple of days? How do you, when you look at the left-hand side of the slide, think about moving beyond personalized experiences to individualized experiences? And there is a difference. How do you optimize the value chain that delivers that optimized experience to, uh, sorry, uh, individualized experience to your customer or your, your staff or, or whoever's part of your value chain. And a couple of things become very obvious when we start unpacking that. One is you have to be able to do it in real, real time. These moments of interaction are fleeting and you need to capture the value in the moment. And to do that more and more, you don't have time to apply a human mind to the massive amounts of data you need to crunch in that moment. And you, you'll have to use uh, machine learning, advanced analytics, prediction and prescription to get that done. The other question is how do you adopt these technologies and when do you adopt these technologies? Because some of them are pretty new, um, some of them are pretty difficult to get your head around, perhaps things like the blockchain, but you, you, you should be looking at them and you've got to pull them together. And of course, the challenge for every organization is if you do this on a very piecemeal way, you're going to wind up with a really complex environment that is fragile, full of risk and difficult to maintain. So we think part of our value proposition is to help you deal with those technologies. And you, again, you saw this slide earlier on, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on it either. Suffice it to say that if there's one thing that encapsulates what SAP is about today, it is this slide. This is what we're working on. This is what our, why we get up in the morning, is to try and figure out with our customers and with our partners and our ecosystem how to make this happen in a way that is fast, reliable, scalable, risk-free, for our customers and to do that in a way that makes sense. So we know you're going to go on a journey. 
We know that journey is going to be different for every single one of you. We know there'll be some best practices, sure, that operate in a domain like finance or in an industry like utilities or retail or what it is, whatever it is. But pretty much everyone's journey will be at a different pace with different emphasis and, and uh, starting it at different points. However, over the course of that journey, you will have to think about how do you move from data to insight? Having gained that insight, how do you take that insight into action? And what new actions, what new experiences could you be delivering by getting this right? And that journey, it's circular, it's iterative. You're going to go through it many, many times. And you have to learn how to go through it much more quickly. And that circle, very nicely, brings me back full circle to Leonardo. Because you've heard a little bit about Leonardo over the course of, of this, uh, the last two days. This is SAP Leonardo which was announced earlier in this year, but kind of got a reboot, Leonardo 2.0, if you like, at Sapphire in May in the United States. Leonardo is not a product, folks. Leonardo is the brand under which we encompass all of the tooling, all of the solutions, all of the products that really help you deal with the mode two stuff in your organization. So you have a brand like SAP S4 HANA in the ERP space, you have SAP Leonardo machine learning in this mode 2 environment, and it will work with these other uh, solutions from SAP and other vendors. Very important, our approach is to be open, our approach is to be modular, so you can adopt this stuff at the speed that you want to do it. So when you, many of you I think follow Gartner, many of you will be familiar with this notion of mode 1 and mode 2, and mode 1 is the stuff where ERP was born, you know, let's get the basics right inside our organization. And, and we've all worked really hard over the last few years to try and make that more digestible, uh, more predictable, get it in faster, get time to value going better. And many of you have done a fantastic job and you've now got this amazing asset that is creating huge amounts of data. So it's a good place to go to start some of these mode two things that you need to get done. Mode two, on the other hand, is all about experimenting and exploring and, and kind of competing with the quirky example that I put out there earlier on. This is where you need to do things really, really fast. Try it out. Does it work? Does the customer like it? If they don't, do we bin it? Do we go through another iteration? If the customer does like it, how do we scale it and kind of bring it over the wall into this mode two world? So very important, you can't look at these two things as, as separate environments living in a vacuum. You have to find a way to create the, mode two, the space to do mode two thinking in your business, uh, but at the same time to recognize that a lot of what you've already got in mode one is gonna support that mode two thing that you're doing uh, in your organization. And we think that's really, really important. And that with Leonardo and having it on a common platform, we can help you make this bimodal world real. Another way to look at it is the digital business framework that again, many of you have seen. And all I want to point out on this slide is as you look at the middle there, you've got that digital core in the center, the next generation uh, ERP, SAP S4 HANA, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem. And around that, as you can see, you have a lot of the mode two capabilities. So machine learning, how do we take that and apply that to some of the data that's sitting in our ERP system so that we can make a process run faster or cheaper or in a different way to, to how we might do it today? And I'll give you an example of that later on. And yet another way to, to look at it is to say the old, old, the, the, the uh, SAP applications like S4HANA and uh, Concur and Ariba and the like are about running your business as effectively and efficiently as possible on best practice. And the Leonardo stuff is about doing new things that help you win new market share or new customers. But again, as I'm trying to suggest on this slide here, there's a very close interlock here. So on the left-hand side, the brands that you will already know and you are, many of you are already using, whether it's Business One or whether it's... Uh, SAP ERP, the old ECC 6.0, or its replacement SAP S4 HANA. And then on the right-hand side, all of these new capabilities, which sit on this SAP cloud platform of ours and tightly integrate into the world on the left-hand side. All of them 
on a common data, pl uh, common data platform, because that's really the secret sauce here. Is if I can use the same piece of data for two or three or four or five different things, then I only need to keep that piece of data in one place. I can secure it better. I, get, I, I have a lower cost in, t in terms of the data I'm storing and so on, and yet at the same time I'm able to do some innovative stuff in my business. So I just want to do now is unpack very quickly. I, I know many of you will have been through an SAP s hana presentation before, but I think there are a couple of people in the audience who haven't. So I'm going to go through this really, really fast. If you need more details, you can, you can uh, talk to me afterwards. And I'm probably going to sound a little bit like Aki did yesterday when he talked about the terms and conditions. So SAP s hana is the next generation ERP from SAP. Everything you know and love about ERP and why you bought ERP remains. Integration, functionality, business processes. Everything you probably don't love, like clunkiness and complexity, we've stripped out in this ERP system. And everything you're going to need for the digital economy, we've added in. So the ability to connect to this digital ecosystem of things and partners and social networks and people that, whether they work for you or buy from you, is part and parcel of this. And the ultimate aim is to be able to deal with a, a lot size of one to a market of one with no latency. A real, real-time business. And there are three really important factors to think about when you think about SAP s the, the new architecture, which is enabled by the underlying SAP HANA platform, the role-based design, which is all about really understanding people, and then the notion of smart business. And I'm going to, again, very quickly whistle through this. If you look at any ERP system, from SAP, from Oracle, from Microsoft, from Info, from anybody, you will find in those ERP systems, and you know this from your own work, hundreds of tables and indexes and aggregates that were put there to try and wrest some kind of performance from a system that was built on a disk-based architecture. In this new in-memory world, we don't have to do that anymore. So we've had the ability now to go back and completely redesign the ERP system and strip all of that crud out so that we now have a very lean, very elegant set of uh, data tables in the system. For IT folks, what that means is taking all of this stuff out brings you to a much more elegant technology stack underneath the system. And in SAP's own uh, migration from ECC6 on a relational database to S4HANA on HANA, we've gone from somewhere around 8.1 terabytes to just over half a terabyte of data storage to deliver the same functionality to the same 65,000 odd people, uh, people in the organization. So distinct savings there. But maybe more excitingly for the digital world we're moving into, when you simplify the code base like that, we can now start to develop new apps much, much faster than we could do in the past. It just becomes easier. And we're figuring, you know, based on current experience, that we're probably able to be able, get stuff out the door twice as fast as we were able to do before. Then there's the user experience. We talk a lot about empathy inside SAP now, not something that was ever on the table when I joined the organization 23 years ago, but it's really about how do people want to do things? How do they want to work? And let's reflect that in the experiences that we offer them. And this becomes even more important when you start to go from B to B to B to B to C, and you start getting your customers and your citizens and your clients interacting directly with your systems. You better be able to offer them an experience that requires no training, is intuitive, and that they will like, because experience is everything when it comes to your brand. And the essence of this uh, role-based environment called SAP Fury is we can pull everything you need together to get the job done. So if you're, for example, a procurement manager, uh, you've been given an alert that there's a material shortage for a production run, you can immediately check, you know, is there budget for this material? Uh, how are the suppliers performing on this material? You can review things like a, a, a detailed report for that material performance or contract renewal dates or whatever information you need to make that decision is right there so you can push it into action very, very quickly. And who would have believed, certainly who was around in the days of... Uh, 3.1, R3 3.1. Who would have believed if you ever worked on a 
interface, that we would be winning design awards at SAP. <laughs> and yet we are. And, uh, and we've got customers who are doing some astonishing stuff with this, with this new front end and really seeing the benefits. So if you're not already using Fury, I'd encourage you to look at what you need to do to get there because the productivity gains you can enjoy are phenomenal. And it's only going to get better, folks, because again, uh, some of you may have missed it, but we announced a strategic partnership recently with Apple. We're bringing Apple's great savvy with consumer products and consumer interfaces together with SAP's great savvy at enterprise scale systems. And we're bringing those two things together so that you can now start to deliver native Apple iOS experiences consuming services out of SAP. So the, I, the iOS developer kit, software developer kit, is embedded in the SAP cloud platform. And there's all sorts of other support and forms of training and so forth that will help you get the best out of that. And the ultimate expression of this is to take us into a world where from the top floor to the shop floor and across the whole organization, we have complete visibility in real time of what's going on in the business. And I just thought I'd show you a fun little advert that kind of expresses that in a way that I'm not able to in a moment. And what, what makes this possible, what you're about to see, is the fact that we now have OLTP and OLAP on one system. So that same piece of data that right now is being updated with a new order line for a customer is instantly available in the reporting tools in that Fury interface. So it gives you this ability to be really, really agile and nimble as an organization. Okay, so what's our latest data say? Our customer's a 21-year-old female heavily into basketball. Wait, data just changed. Now she's into disc sports. Uh, no, she's not. Since when? Since now. She's into Tai Chi. She found disc sports too stressful. Hold on, let me ask you this. What's she gonna like six months from now? <laughs> Who do we have on aerial karate? Steve. Steve. And Alexis. Uh, no, just Steve. Just Steve. Just Steve. Live business powered by SAP. When you run live, you run simple. I'm glad I'm not Steve. <laughs> so, j uh, something else I want to just k spend a couple of words on, and I'd, I really want you to go and explore this. Uh, talk to your AEs if, if, if you have any difficulties here. Is the, again, the tool we launched at um, Sapphire this year which is the Digital Transformation Navigator. How many of you use the Solution Explorer from SAP? Okay, so a couple of you. This is kind of Solution Explorer on steroids. And effectively, what we're responding to here is you saying to us, I've invested hugely in this ECC6 platform I've got. Now you're telling me I've got to go to SAP s by 2025. How the hell do I get there? You know, you might be an existing customer who is trying to figure that out. You might be an existing customer who wants to understand how some of these new cloud solutions fit into your landscape. You might be a brand new customer looking for a new platform. But you've got lots of questions. And the idea that we're trying to do with the Transformation Navigator is make this much easier for you to start figuring out what this journey uh, looks like. And to answer all the kind of questions that you have when you contemplate this kind of move inside your organization. And again, I'm not going to go through all those questions. You'll get these slides later. So this thing is up. It's live. It is the first edition, folks. So it's not perfect. And there's probably going to be the odd bug in it. But I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at it. Um, it's, it's, the route we're going with this thing is ultimately it's going to suck down data from your solution manager. It's going to allow you to configure where you want to go. And it's going to tell you some answers around what you should be doing. It brings together the SAP customer engagement model, so the way we want to work with you to pr you know, provide business value, and as well as many of the tools we already have in place, like the Solution Explorer, like your Solution Manager, like our Value Lifecycle Management, our benchmarking databases and so forth, it pulls that all together. And in a self-service way, it allows you to answer a whole lot of questions, and at the end of the day, we'll spit out for you a nice comprehensive document that gives you an idea as to what you've got to do, why you should do it, and how to go about it. As I say, it's the first edition, so it may, you, it may have the odd glitch in it, but please use it and please give us feedback because it's the only way it will improve and as it improves, you're gonna get more value out of it. And then just to start wrapping up, I wanna talk a little bit about the, 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 the uh, Leonardo system. 
I'm not going to labor on this because you've, we've, we've touched on these things earlier on, but understand it's there to help you with your mode two. Okay? This is where you're going to find machine learning. This is where you're going to find IoT. This is where you're going to find the ability to extend your existing systems in ways that we may not be addressing today, in ways that the partners may not be addressing today. And when that happens, you have the ability now to innovate and co-innovate with SAP to get that done. Here's one example of this kind of world we're moving into. What we're doing here is we're ingesting 12 spectral layer data from the Earth observation satellites run by the European Space Agency, pulling that into the HANA database and marrying that with business processes. So in this particular example, an organization called Munich Re is looking at 250,000 fires across the United States and using that data to predict where the next fires might be so they can help their customers to manage risk better. At the same time, knowing exactly what the boundaries of a fire look like, they're able to repudiate claims where people take a chance and said, my house just burnt down in that big fire. They can say, no, it didn't, because we know you're over there, and the fire was over there. Close, but no cigar, go away, kind of thing. Okay, and of course, they, they build these sophisticated prediction models will help them to manage risk better. But it's a great example of taking data from somewhere else, marrying it with data about your existing customers, applying some machine learning to that data, figuring out what might happen next, and being able to provide new value, in this case, to Munich Re's customers. Another example is the new cash application, uh, applica cash application, application? Cash application squared that uh, SAP's uh, just launched. And that, uh, at the moment, that only runs against SAP s hana in the cloud. But I want to give you a sense as to what that's all about as well. And I'm going to let this video run. So hopefully that gives you a sense as to how we can use these kind of tools to really support people. It's not about getting rid of the jobs, it's about unlocking that talent that today is doing really mundane stuff so that it can focus on value-added activities inside your organization. 
Those capabilities are also the basis for the SAP Leonardo suite of applications that we're bringing you in things like connected assets, connected fleet, um, connected markets and so forth. We don't have a lot of time to go through that. So what I will do is show you an example again of how this manifests. Now what you're going to see in this example is a proof of concept that we built for Mobile World earlier this year. And very importantly, because you're all going to have to do this as well, it's about collaborating. We built this together with Hertz, Conquer, Nokia, and ourselves. And again, I'm hey just going to let this run and we'll close hectic, on this. Hey guys, our right? Between organizing our business travel, managing receipts, trying to deal with logistics, sometimes wouldn't it be nice to have your very own concierge or maybe your own digital assistant? And what if that digital assistant could be your very own car? I'm Trisha Batting Smith with SAP, and this is Timo Selzer. And uh, how is this co innovation possible? Yeah, we teamed up as a co innovation project with Hertz, Concur, SAP, and Nokia, and we want to just make the life easier of the business traveler. Uh, walk me through it. How does it work? What do I need to do first? Yeah, first of all, you, you need to go somewhere when you when you're on your business trip, right? And I see here that my next meeting is in the city. First thing what I want to do is to reserve a parking spot there because I don't want to drive around and don't find parking at all. I just click here on, on, on this app and I see all the inventory around me. I select the right parking spot, I pay for it, and now I push the location to the car. And all that inventory comes from SAP Vehicles Network and uh, it's very easy to access it through the app. So, we've just seen how this works. Let's go test it out. Let's get in the car. Yeah, let's okay, go. Let's go. So the app is directing us to our parking lot so we can get to our meeting on time. Exactly. So the navigation brings us there. When we are arriving at the parking spot, the car will sense that and will magically open the gate for us. Here we are. You've arrived at Portside Garage. You have a reservation here. Shall I open the gate? Yes. Well, let's do it. Let's go to our business meeting. Let's go to our meeting. Okay. Now that lunch is done, I've got a notification that it's time to make our way to the airport. And I have to refuel first, so I just say here yes, and I get all the gas stations close to the airport. I select one, and the only thing what I have to do now is to push that location to the car. Here we are, and... You are in front of pump number five. Do you want to start fueling now? Cool, isn't it? Yes. So what's happening? You see the pump gets pre-authorized, and we are good to go. All through our day, all of these receipts have automatically been populating my expense report through Concur. So the parking, the gassing, the business lunch, all that is automatically accounted for. Expense report is done. We're clocking out. Yeah, we fuel up the car, so we're good to go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Do we get to keep the car? Oh, unfortunately not. <laughs> but you can bring it back to the airport for me. <laughs> so I'm probably going to blow my green credentials here, but who's a petrol head in the room here? How's the sound of that V8? Nothing rumbles like a V8. Folks, I'm gonna, I want to wrap it up on that. I hope what I've given you here is a taste of what Leonardo is all about. And if you just think about that last example, what are you seeing there is things like APIs being used to call information from parking, uh, parking systems that manage the parking systems, from garages and forecourts that are in the area, mashing that up with geospatial technology so we understand where these things are and we can push it to the to the, uh, the car and, and thus navigate to where we need to go. Integrating the data that's coming back from a fuel pump about how much fuel we've just taken on board with Concur for better expense management. So it's just a glimpse of some of the possibilities that are available to you when you embrace the SAP uh, Leonardo framework. And even more so when you start coupling it with some of those applications that are already available like Concur and Ariba and s for hana and Field Glass and, and the various others that we have. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you got a little bit more insight and I hope you have a fabulous party this evening. Before you go, Simon, you just get a glimpse of your socks again there. 
man, those are so cool, man. <laughs> Actually, mine are no, much, your, yours are much more brighter. Mine are much brighter than his. They're much brighter. In and, fact, and, I'm so, and so are you. I'm so bright, my mother calls me son. <laughs> Simon Carpenter, thank you so much.